by Boarding Comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Ladies and gentlemen, the East Midlands of England in the third decade of the third millennium. This is an ad hoc mob in Nottingham storming and looting McDonald's, very much in the tradition of the town, stealing from the rich multinational to give to... Uh, well, themselves. Every man his own Robin Hood looking for a friar with some tuck on it, as Andy No notes in his tweet, quote, police made no arrests. Where's the sheriff of Nottingham when you need him? Well, the sheriff and all his men are too busy rehearsing for the next transgender awareness parade. Copper loser, Her Majesty's Constabulary are the last people on the planet to think the Macarena is cool. Everyone else figured out a quarter century ago that the Macarena is dancing for people who can't dance. So it turns out the British police are as lousy at dancing as they are at solving burglaries or rape. The crime charging rate is down to 1.3%. And 1.3 is about what those guys would get on Strictly 2. We're going to call Len Goodman and Darcy Bustle in for a one-hour special analyzing the pathetic dancing of UK coppers. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, looting McDonald's. Have you noticed how everything is screwed? There's no law enforcement. There's no health service. This winter, there'll be no heating. Well, there will be if you've got five and a half grand plus whatever the 18.6% inflation is up to by then. If you think the answer to the wasteland all around is even narrower constraints of public discourse and even more deference to the official expert narrative, well, Her Majesty's government has a so-called online harms bill you're going to love. Lord Sumption is here to weigh in on that, plus a couple of people who've already been cancelled and shadow banned and all the rest of it. Claire Craig and Alex Mitchell are here and our pal Natalie Winters will be along uh, to talk about the expert, the tutti experti, America's Anthony Fauci, uh, the sex beast of octogenarian public health bureaucrats. Yeah, I'm being serious. The Guardian proclaims, look at the the Guardian proclaims Anthony Fauci, the sexiest man alive. Yes, public health is the new rock and roll. Has Britain's Professor Pantsdown got a piece of that sexiest man alive? Sexiest man in the British Isles, at least. Uh, plus, the most important part of the show, you. Let me know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me at gbnews. We are the people's channels. If we don't hear from the people, we're not doing it right. So far away. All that after the latest headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Thank you, Mark. Good evening. It is 8.03. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. 
The Tory leadership hustings are currently taking place in Birmingham as Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak go head to head. We'll bring you more on that in the, in the next hour. Earlier on, Ms Truss said that business as usual is not the right way to deal with the cost of living crisis. It comes as industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director says half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January when the energy prices could reach £4,600. The Foreign Secretary says her first priority as Prime Minister is to ease the pressures people face. I will immediately take action to reduce taxes, to have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy to save people money on their fuel bills, because I recognise people are facing an immediate struggle. I'm prepared to be bold as Prime Minister. I'm prepared to do things differently. And growing the economy is vital. Meanwhile, earlier on, Rishi Sunak hit out at Ms Truss as he warned his rival's plans could pour fuel on the fire and worsen inflation. He also says he'll do all he can to support those that need it most. I cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn and winter. And I know things are difficult, and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. A manhunt is underway after a nine-year-old child was fatally shot in Liverpool last night. Police have named the schoolgirl who was killed as Olivia Pratt Corbell. Officers were called to a house in the Knotty Ash area after an unknown man who was being chased by a gunman forced his way into the property. Police say shots were fired, hitting a woman, Olivia's mother, and fatally wounding the young girl. Detectives are urging criminals to assist with their inquiries and are asking anyone with information to come forwards. A woman who was reported missing nearly eight weeks ago has been found safe and well. The Met Police says 24-year-old student nurse Owami Davies was found in Hampshire after a call to police from someone who'd seen media appeals. She was last seen walking in Croydon in early July and concern had been growing for her safety. My officers have worked around the clock um, following thousands of lines of inquiry in order to locate Owami Davies. But I would like to thank the media and the members of the public who assisted so much in this, in this case. A record number of channel migrants have crossed the English Channel in a single day. Nearly 1,300 were detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of lorries also continues to be an ongoing problem. In the past year... Official figures reveal around 8,000 people were detected at UK ports having illegally crossed the channel. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Mark Stein. That's a truly terrible story out of Liverpool about that nine-year-old girl. I'll just add one point to what Nigel was talking about earlier. In America, they have the broken windows theory of policing, that if the police hunt down small crimes, like uh, a guy breaking a window on an abandoned warehouse, if they make those small crimes impossible, uh, they shrivel the space in which the big crimes, like murder, can occur. And that worked in Rudy Giuliani's New York in the 1990s. We have the opposite of the broken window theory. As you know, if you call 999 to say that your car's been broken into, that your home's been broken into, uh, actually, if you've been raped... Uh, we have a crime uh, charging rate of 1.3%. Uh, the other, whatever that is, 98.7% uh, uh, aren't even summonsed. And in that opposite broken windows theory, more and more crimes, uh, car theft, burglary, mugging, rape, uh, you create huge spaces for the horrors that we saw in Liverpool. Broken Britain, broken Britain, 
What are we going to do about it? When are we going to have a political class that actually gets serious about any of this stuff? You know, you let a 1,300 people a day walk into your country. Is it really so surprising uh, that uh, you then lose control of your domestic areas and your cities too? We've had two and a half years of rule by experts, not just in the UK, but across the Western world. And I couldn't honestly say it's going great, but your mileage may vary. Nevertheless, if you like the last couple of years, the government's new bill constraining free speech is going to give you more of it. To get the obvious out of the way first, yes, there is a lot of vile stuff out there on the Internet. But with the so-called online safety bill, the cure is worse than the disease, just like COVID policy, oddly enough. It's almost uh, like that's the standard operating procedure. The government's proposed bill introduces the novel concept to British life of, quote, legal Legal but harmful. Uh, OK. Harmful to whom? Oh, well, that depends. Harmfulness is mostly in the eyes of the be harmed. For example, you might think that uh, letting over a thousand young men in a single day get ferried in by the border force and the Royal National Lifeboat Institute to the express check-in at Folkestone and Dover and be put up at the Holiday Inn with an unlimited uh, tab on room service is not in the best interests of the people of a small and already densely populated island. But it could be perceived as racist, couldn't it? A bit uh, Sudanophobic. And that may be legal, but it's harmful. You might think that letting biologically male athletes identify as women for the purposes of sporting contests isn't fair. And if it's not fair, it's not sport, by definition, is it? That's legal to say that, but it could be harmful. It could be harmful to thousands of fragile, delicate young ladies who are hung like stallions. You might think that thousands of working class girls getting gang raped for years on end in towns up and down the country is a national scandal. And it's time to stop burying it in coy, evasive euphemisms like, quote, Asian males, a category that covers almost two thirds of men on the planet. Whereas when you look at the fellows who actually get convicted, it all seems a bit more specific, at least in uh, Huddersfield. Oh, no, 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 no. It may be legal to say that, but it's very harmful. It could be perceived as culturally insensitive to uh, cultures that like uh, child gang rape. You might think that excess mortality running at just shy of a thousand extra deaths per week for over three months now is about as basic as it gets. And you'd like the government to look into why it's happening, because that's a lot of extra corpses. OK, that is legal, legal technically to say, but it could be totally harmful and discourage people from getting in the queue for their 27th booster shot. You might look at today's map of electricity prices in Europe. It's uh, 400 euros per megawatt hour. In Sweden and Poland now, it's 500 euros per megawatt hour in Finland and Latvia. And let's see, it's 600 euros per megawatt hour in France, Germany and Italy, and 636 euros per megawatt hour in the United Kingdom. Until, oh, two years ago, anything more than 100 euros per megawatt hour was almost unimaginable. But you whining about your electric bill could be interpreted as giving sucker to climate denialists, which is legal, but very, very, very harmful, not just to the planet in general, uh, but to as yet unborn residents of the Maldives in the 22nd century. On the other hand, do you think the stabbing of British novelists is a grand thing and you'd like to see more of it? Are you the vice president of the Society of Engineers and Technologists in Pakistan and you want to offer 20 million bucks for someone to behead a Dutch politician you don't like. Yeah, what's it say? Uh, after the attack on Salman Rushdie, inshallah, the next number is Hit Wilders. Anyone in the world, he's the Dutch populist politician. Any in the one in the world gives me the head of Hit Wilders, I will give him 20 million dollars. I want Hit Wilders' head. We want head. All Muslims want head. That's Rihan M. Sabir.
panting for the head of Heerd Wilders. In a narrow, legalistic sense, it's not legal to offer money to incentivize the decapitation of named individuals, but evidently it's not terribly harmful, it's no biggie. The guy's still got his uh, Facebook uh, page up. Look, there he is, Raheen M. Saber. Uh, that was uh, just a couple of hours ago. Uh, so whatever it is, a week and a half after he offered 20 million bucks for the head of Hit Builders. So he's not as harmful as Charlotte Wright, who was on the show last night, talking about losing her husband at 32 to AstraZeneca. And every time Charlotte mentions it on Twitter, it's instantly labelled as misleading fake news disinformation. If only Charlotte would stick to beheading threats against named individuals. So what does all this leave to talk about, aside from decapitating British novelists and Dutch politicians? Well, celebs, royals, footy, probably mostly women's footy, but less and less open discourse on anything that matters at a time when we have never needed it more. If you like the big shut up, this bill will make it even bigger. Lord Sumption is a distinguished historian and a former judge on the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, and he aired his own thoughts on this subject in The Spectator. Just let me start with your first sentence, because you drew attention to the fact that this bill is 218 pages. And I happened to look up the 1935 Government of India Act, which I think for two-thirds of a century was the longest bill ever passed by the British Parliament, and that's only 196 pages to govern an entire subcontinent. So what is it about this that requires... Why, why is it 218 pages? What, what, what does that tell you about it? The main thing it tells you about it is that this is a statute that is trying to regulate the unregulatable and the undefinable. Um, standards of parliamentary drafting have gone down over the last uh, 100 years in a big way. And this is a very complicated bill because it's trying to do the impossible, and it just uses more words to do that. But let me make it clear for a start that the bill is actually a well-intentioned bill uh, it's, uh, and it aims at some targets which need to be hit at. Uh, the main targets of this bill are illegal content on the internet uh, and pornography. So illegal, illegal material has got to be taken down, pornography has got to be subject to uh, age verification. I don't have any problem about that and I don't think anyone else should have any problem. The really big problem is the one that you've identified, which is the so-called legal and harmful bit. This is an attempt to control and to require internet service companies to control material that it's perfectly legal to talk about, perfectly legal to give speeches about, but which you, if this bill is passed, can't talk about on the internet without a number of government controls being imposed. I think there are two big things wrong with that. First of all, we should not be imposing criminal liabilities on internet companies for things that we can't define, uh, even uh, in a, a statute which is several hundred pages long. Mm. Uh, the second problem about it is that it confers the kind of powers on government ministers which they should not have. It basically requires Ofcom, the telecommunications regulator, to supervise this very complicated process. Um, and the vagueness of the statute is going to be given precision by so-called guidance coming from Ofcom. And the guidance depends in, in part on what government ministers want. They have to submit it to government ministers who can change it. We know some of the things that government ministers will want to introduce. It, they call it misinformation and disinformation. Now, uh, what is harmful and what is misinformation and disinformation? We had an example of this in the pandemic. There was a great deal of controversy about the lockdown, some controversy about vaccines, and basically 
anything which is contrary to government policy is capable of being labelled as misinformation and disinformation. Personally, I do not think that the government should have power to identify the kind of things which people are allowed to speak about on the internet. They don't have that power uh, when people are delivering speeches um, uh, in public. They don't have that power when people are writing articles in newspapers. Why should they have it uh, when they are speaking on the internet? Hmm. No, you're quite right about that. And the Ofcom thing is disturbing because Ofcom in March uh, 2020 effectively issued advice to broadcasters uh, suggesting that they not counter the government narrative. So if you happen to think lockdowns are rubbish and do more damage and all the rest of it, Ofcom is on, on your case then. Why you would then give Ofcom the internet as well as the television and radio industries is, is most bizarre. Uh, if this bill had come up, you know, from Justin Trudeau, I wouldn't have been surprised. It's entirely, he's always been inimical to free speech. It's a little more surprising, don't you think, from a conservative government, because none of this is going to do anything for uh, the main victims of this. Uh, are going to be the kind of ideas that the Conservative Party's voters would like to talk about. Isn't, isn't that so? Well, first of all, let me say this. Uh, I don't think it's true that Ofcom issued instructions that people were not to counter government policy on the lockdown. Mm. Um, that's often said, but I don't believe it's correct. What is undoubtedly correct is that the internet service companies engaged in a great deal of self-censorship on this subject. And that is the picture that we're going to see more of if this bill is passed, because uh, in order to avoid in prison, prison sentences, swinging fines of up to 10% of worldwide turnover, uh, internet companies are going to have to take a line of maximum caution. If in doubt, then cut it out. That is what is likely to happen. And we know what that implies because perfectly respectable opponents of government policy during the lockdown uh, were effectively taken down by uh, outfits like Facebook and, uh, and YouTube. Indeed, mm. YouTube has a published set of guidelines which says that they will take down anything which counters official advice from health authorities or from the World Health Organization. Now, that is where we are ending up if we privilege uh, information that is officially approved or approved by respectable bodies like Ofcom or like uh, uh, some of the bodies that will be given power under this statute. Uh, I think that that is a very difficult area. Human knowledge, human understanding advances by confronting falsehoods, not by trying to hide it away. Yeah, you're quite, you're quite right about that. But to, just to go back to the point you made about how bills are poorly drafted compared to the way they used to be a century ago, isn't this rather like one of those American bills where it's 200 and whatever pages long? Because essentially special interests uh, have all put forward what they want and the bill is actually no more than a kind of juggling to squeeze in all the particular carve-outs and priorities that these guys want. So like fact-checkers like Full Fact and various other interested parties are all getting a piece of the action. If this were just about uh, the child pornography and the other very small areas that are the proper uh, province of the criminal law, this would shorten, it'd be a 20-page bill, wouldn't it? Well, it could be a much shorter bill if it confined itself to illegal material and material harmful to children like pornography. Um, the basic reason why the bill is as bad as it is is I don't think it's anything to do with special interest groups. It's actually to do with the fact that the government is being too ambitious. It's trying to do something that is impossible. And in the course of doing it, it's going to achieve a great deal of collateral harm. That's why the bill is as complicated mm. as it is. Mm.
Well, that's a that's a, an excellent summation of it, and your piece on the spectator in the Spectator this week is a terrific read on it. And actually, there ought to be more discussion of this. Uh, Lord Sumption, thank you. I, as I understand the position of both leadership candidates, this thing is on hold at the moment, but it shouldn't be on hold. Uh, it should be kicked into touch and never heard from again. Uh, coming up, we're going to get uh, to your reaction, GB Views at GBNews.UK. Uh, and amid the constraints of an increasingly totalitarian media environment, we'll try to open up the conversation a little. Uh, my remaining guests, all of them, have all been clobbered by the big shut-up on social media to one degree or another. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. GB News is the People's Channel, so let's hear what the people are saying. This uh, legal but harmful, legal but harmful, just the kind of concept we need uh, in our jurisprudence. Stuart Young Esquire says, I know what legal means, but harmful is a perspective. Yeah, you can't argue against that. If someone says, oh, oh I found what you said uh, incredibly harmful to me. I was triggered by it. Well, that's their reaction, and you've got no defence to that, which is why it shouldn't be a legal matter. Luffy Dude says, if something is bad, then make it illegal. Problem with harmful is that the truth is offensive. Um, that is very... What was the name of that fantastic uh, jurist in the First World War who came up about the th thing about the realm of manners? At one end, you have stuff that you're forbidden to do. At the other end, you have stuff that you're obliged to do, like, uh, you know, join the army when there's a war, whatever. And you measure a society uh, by the bit in the middle where it is self-regulated, regulated in the realm of manners. And you've got a healthy society if there's the stuff you can't do and the stuff you can do, but the 90% in the middle uh, is self-regulated by a free people. Once it starts shriveling by these crazy people, crazy uh, socialist people who are ideologically disposed to that, and then crazy so-called conservative people doing it as well, like Nadine Doris is, the realm... Lord Moulton, that's his name. 
great British judge, realm of manners. Once you shrivel the realm of manners, you're kaput. He was fantastic. Uh, he had the best job title I've ever heard during the First World War. He was director of the explosives department. And that's the sort of thing government should be doing rather than regulating free speech on the internet. The online harms bill will lead to more groupthink from the pom-pom girls of the British media demanding punishment for anyone who dissents. Here's pom-pom girl number one. Let's have a look at this from the uh, Daily Mail. Oh, yeah, who's this guy? It's time to punish Britain's five million vaccine refuseniks, says Andrew Neil. Why shouldn't we curb some of their freedoms? Yeah, whatever happened to uh, Andrew Neil? Why shouldn't we curb some of their freedoms? Here's Pom Pom Girl number two. Uh, he called for the unvaccinated to be denied NHS treatment. Unfortunately, everyone's being denied NHS treatment now, so it's hard to single anybody out for punitive measures. Was that 87-year-old guy in Cornwall uh, left lying on the pavement waiting for an ambulance for 15 hours with his broken ribs? Oh, they'll do, if you just lie there for another 15 hours, uh, they'll soon clear up those broken ribs. Was he unvaccinated? Oh, let's have a bit more from Pom Pom Girl number two, because I love this bit. Uh, look at this. Imagine being scared of having a safe, well-regulated four-second vaccine shot when previous generations braved gunshots for years on end to save us all from tyranny. Anti-vaxxers really are a bunch of spineless pussies, says Piers Morgan. It's easy to talk butch when you're being flown around on uh, Rupert Murdoch's private plane all week long. Uh, the big shots of the British media there. I said at the top of the show that the cure is worse than the disease. Random headline from the last week. Quote, lockdown effects feared to be killing more people than COVID. Oh, my, you don't say. Well, actually, quite a few people did say. But as Lord Sumption was talking about just a minute ago, they wound up getting vaporised by the commissars of the internet. As Piers Morgan would say, there's nothing wrong with lockdown that even more lockdown wouldn't cure. Just give it to us longer and harder, because there's still a couple of corners of the economy we haven't totally wrecked. We talk about the vaccine victims on this show because the rubble of their lives is the cruelest indictment of our incompetent ruling class. On Twitter... If someone mentions suffering adverse effects from the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca, they get sneered at. Oh, yeah, side effects. You had a sore arm for 20 minutes, did you? No. Alex Mitchell lost his leg. Here he is learning to walk with his new one. Thanks for the thumbs up there. I see that in what passes for wit on the internet, someone responded to news of Alex's amputation by saying, well, at least he gets 50% off on shoes and socks. Ha ha. But as you can see from that video, even that leaden jest is untrue. Uh, Alex, welcome to the show. I'm sorry about the lip of the stage because you actually had to <laughs> hop up onto it. Uh, how, how, how is it going with your, uh, with your new leg? It's getting there. Um, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge um, mm. because I've had some issues mm. internally that we thought was m more serious than what it turned out to be. It's now working through some heavy prosthetics, um, mm. physiotherapy, which was the last of you saw yep. yesterday. That's them. I'm now away for three months. Yeah. That's them wanting to see if I keep the progress I've made. Um, we're getting there. I'm now to one stick. You're, you have a good attitude that, is, that actually requires some determination and some will to maintain. You were treating last week that one of your fellow vaccine victims yeah. um, just committed suicide. That's four in the last five, six months, Mark. Um, mm. Two of them were actual people that had COVID, mm. long COVID or long horrors, mm. as we call them. Mm. Uh, it's just been recognised now that long COVID exists. Mm. These people got to the stage where they'd had enough. So that's, we've lost two long COVID and two vaccine injured to suicide because nobody is helping them. Yes. And when they go and try and tell the world through social media, you get misinformation from Twitter, or they mm. get banned or suspended, or, like myself, you get it from 
those that took the va the, the pro vaccine mm -hmm. saying you're being anti vaccine mm -hmm. because you're being negative against the vaccine and you're getting it from the anti vaxxer saying when you took it in the first place. Yeah. You know, so we get it from both ends and everywhere in the middle. And when the government put misleading posts, that just lets the whole world into give us abuse. And these people are at a level where they're you know, you trying to explain the dark places that some of us have to visit. Mm -hmm. Uh, not because you want to, because you're told that you may not survive the next 24 hours. Yes. And then to deal with that trauma, and then you're, deal, you're trying to deal with what's happened to you, you can't do that. Well, your, your friend, uh, this, this latest suicide, there is a something lonely and isolating about this. It's also psychologically quite difficult, I would have thought, because if you have a bad uh, car crash or you have a terrible accident and you lose your leg, you, you understand something has happened to you and it, it has had devastating consequences, but you survived the car crash and you're lucky to be alive. Here, you just went along, uh, you took a vaccine that everyone, you know, everyone from the Queen down says you should take this vaccine and you wind up losing your leg. Is that tough to deal with? Beyond belief. Um... And it's special when they tell you that, you know, you're making up. Mm. That is the hardest part, mm. you know. Luckily for myself, I didn't have that medically from the beginning. It was pretty much early confirmed what we were looking at and where this was going. But, you know, to, to know that one minute you were perfectly healthy and fit, you know, you're at your work. No. Have you um, heard from the government about compensation? Um, I got awarded, I was the first 11 person to be awarded the vaccine damage payment scheme on yep. the 22nd of June. Other than that, no. Well, since then, there's been one more. I mean, it's quite incredible to me. There's only 12 people that the government has decided to compensate, most of whom have actually been on this show, strangely enough. Yeah. Do, you, do you think they're deliberately slow-walking this? Yes. They've got thousands of yes. applications. The 1,704 applications as of uh, Freedom of Information two days ago. Yeah. I think 40 of, 52 processed, yeah. as you say, 12 payouts, 40 yeah. rejected. But they're coming in by 70 claims in average a, a week. Yeah. Yeah. There's 10 years before we catch up. Yeah. You can't do this to people. No. You just ask people to do the right thing. That's mm. actually a very important point. If the, unless they I improve the rate of this, it's going to be 10 years before they clear the backlog yeah. now, and there's, and there's likely to be more of uh, this. Claire Craig is also with us, and Claire, uh, as you know, she's been on this show before. I, I would normally plug her Twitter feed, but she's been 86th from Twitter. She's gone. Uh, she's out. Um, what do, you, what do you make of uh, Alex's, when Alex talks about people committing suicide because essentially no one's believing that they've been injured by the vaccine? I mean, it's, it's horrific, isn't it? And I think that the injuries are a, a really difficult thing to have to cope with. But to have to cope with not being listened to on top of that and not being able to find healthcare professionals that will take you seriously on top of that, mm. you know, I think that's bound to have a horrible psychological impact. And, and you know, we ha as a society are responsible for that, really, I think, all of us. Well, I think what, what's interesting as well is that even when you have had confirmation, when you've got uh, people have death certificates and coroner's certificates and they're still not believed. Um, you know, as I've come to know people like Alex, um, a line I notice recurs again and again. It did from Charlotte uh, Wright last night on this show, and she was talking uh, about her perfectly healthy 32-year-old husband who had no reason himself to fear the COVID and thus had no reason to get the vaccine. He got jabbed to prevent himself transmitting it to those more vulnerable than him. And so he died. And we now know that being vaccinated doesn't prevent you transmitting the disease. Just to take the most famous example, uh, Joe Biden has caught the COVID twice from a vaccinated person, because if you're not vaccinated, you can't get near Joe Biden. But the question I find interesting is, did they know it did not prevent transmission at the time? Here's Deborah Burks, the second best known face in American public health after Commissar Fauci. 
I knew these vaccines were not going to protect against infection, and I think we overplayed the vaccines. We overplayed the vaccines. So, so let me just put it to you bluntly, Claire. Do you think they knew back at the launch that this would actually not uh, significantly slow transmission of the disease? I think they could have known. So what they were presented with by the pharmaceutical companies was a picture of a very, very effective vaccine that, had it worked in the way that it was presented, would have had a big impact on infection. And I certainly thought it was going to. Mm. Um, but when you actually find out that one of, for instance, one of Pfizer's outcomes that they set out to measure mm. in their trial was the antibody levels in these people. And when you look at the antibody results that have been released because of a Texas court ensuring that they were through an FOI, yeah. those documents show that the levels of antibodies in the treatment group versus a placebo group mm. was only about a 50% reduction at right. most. And so it just shows that the regulators were not going through that, that asking those obvious questions and checking what the pharmaceutical companies were presenting. Um, so, you know, I think you have to have a, an element of cynicism when you're dealing with pharmaceutical companies. You shouldn't take their word on everything. Um, mm. and, and that seemed to have been lacking. Yeah. Why does that happen everywhere, except I think India, which wanted to look at Pfizer uh, a little more closely than the United States and the European Union. Uh, and so Pfizer wound up actually yanking the product uh, from India. Why did nobody, why, why did none of the regulators, uh, British, European, America, and why did none of them apparently do their job? I think there's an element of them always um chasing each other and copying each other and wanting to be first. Mm. There's a sort of an element of power in being the regulator that calls things first mm. because then the others are bound to follow you because otherwise mm. they would rock the boat with, you know, if, you, if one regulator has approved it. So the dynamics of that relationship internationally is, it's, frankly, it doesn't work. You, know, you can't mm. have that system working. And likewise, we've got a system where the, the one regulator is responsible both for approving, mm. albeit an emergency approval, and the safety. And so you've got the same people who are conflicted, which is not a clever way to run things. No, uh, that's true. Uh, the AstraZeneca, we're now told, which was supposedly this great British success story, apparently is no longer necessary and the government won't be ordering any more of it. Should we read significance into that decision? So the AstraZeneca doses that were given plummeted a mm. long time ago, but they kept trickling them out so they mm. couldn't be accused of having stopped. Mm. Um, but I mean, I think AstraZeneca has taken a lot of ab abuse around, you know, it being yeah. more harmful, but I'm not sure that that's really justified necessarily. I think when you look in the round, the problem is with the spike protein rather right. than with, with the other elements of the, what different companies have put it into. No, that's uh, that's very interesting. Are you uh, are you familiar now, Alex, with think terms that uh, like spike protein? That oh you, yeah, uh, I, I now know words I, I didn't know I needed to know. Yeah, like thrombiotic and thrombothenia. It took yeah. me three weeks to learn how to say that. Yeah, well, that's very good. That's <laughs> very good. You've got, you've got a a fantastic attitude uh, towards towards this. and talk about how the vaccines were sold to the public at large. Do you think you were in a position to give informed consent to these things? No, I've thought about this long and hard. Um, and obviously what we now know is official now and what we thought we knew then. We now know that they knew 20 years ago mm. that the adrenal vector that AstraZeneca used was causing clotting issues. Mm. And they still went ahead. Mm. You know, had I known that, I would not been nowhere near that. I had no reason, Mark. No. I was 57, well, that time, 56, mm. scaffolder, less mm. than 5% body fat. Yeah. Supremely yeah. healthy. In fact, no. I had no reason to take it other than we didn't want to kill grannies, we didn't want to kill vulnerable people. That was only, we did try to do the right thing. And we now know that we did the wrong thing. We trusted you, our government. 
Yeah, and if you hadn't had it, people would have called you a granny killer. And, yeah. it's, and, and this is no way. There, a great evil has been, been done because basically we've asked people uh, to have a medical intervention for non-medical reasons. That's actually ethically very dubious all by itself, isn't it, Claire? Um, yeah, so the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human mm. Rights makes clear that any medical intervention has to be for the benefit of that person and not for the wider society. Spelt mm. out in black and white, decided in situations where people were calm and mm. you know, able to discuss it in the absence of emotion. And we've got into an emotional situation where that's just been disregarded. Yeah. No. And, and Her Majesty the Queen, and I am as loyal a subject as anyone in the Dominion of Canada, Her Majesty the Queen, when she said, you were selfish if you didn't take the vaccine. That's not why you put stuff in your body. Uh, you put stuff in your body because you need it, not for some uh, overall societal target. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you, Alex. Coming up, we have Stump the Stein, GB Views at GB News, and Natalie Winters is here. Don't touch that dial, we're coming right back. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. So what's coming next? Well, remember the Spanish flu? A century ago, it killed tens of millions of people around the planet. But that's no reason not to pay researchers to bring it back. Here's a headline from Forbes. Scientists have recreated the deadly 1918 flu virus. Why? Good question. From the Forbes story, quote, a team of scientists in Canada and the US report that they have recreated the 1918 influenza virus and used it to infect macaque. Uh, macaques, that's a type of monkey. Yes, that's right. It started as a lame running joke on this show, and now crazy gain of function scientists are actually doing it. All together now. Jabba, 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 said the monkey to the chimp. Go! Jabba, dabba, 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 said the chimpy to the monkey. Dabba, 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 said the monkey to the chimp. 
Yeah, infecting monkeys with the Spanish flu. That seems sure to work out well. If you were one of those whose initial reaction to the COVID was, well, those Chinese commies are doing all kinds of wacky stuff, some of it was bound to escape. The takeaway from the last two years is that the really wacky stuff at the Wuhan Institute of Virology is being funded by United States taxpayers. And Anthony Fauci has signed off on it. Fauci has been working for the government of the United States since 1968. He's basically the J. Edgar Hoover of public health. He knows where all the bodies are buried, and there are a lot of bodies. He's supposedly the highest salaried bureaucrat in America, and he's going to be the most lavishly pensioned. He's decided he's retiring. He'll be getting 350 grand per annum in retirement versus, say, 120,000 pounds for Charlotte. Right, as we heard last night. With me now is Natalie Winters, investigative journalist at the National Pulse. Natalie, uh, why do you think he's decided to, uh, to retire right now? I know it's certainly curious timing coming from someone who is probably the most egotistical and narcissistic public health official that the United mm. States has ever had. But I think it's because he knows that Republicans are going to take back the House um, come November, and they are going to start their investigations, which will hopefully and ultimately lead to criminal prosecution. So I think he's trying uh, to save himself while he can. Um, this is someone, Anthony Fauci, who is so concerned with his personal legacy. You can see in all the interviews he does, that's what he always talks about. Um, so I think mm. he's trying to get out of office and uh, the NIAID specifically, that's a branch of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, um, because he knows that these investigations specifically into the origins of COVID-19 and what he was doing with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, but also how the National Institutes of Health has really not served in, in any way, shape, or form to defend the public interest when it came to pharmaceutical companies, the testing of COVID-19 vaccines, and of course, lockdowns and mask mandates. So Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, resigned last year. So Anthony Fauci, I think, is just following yeah. in his lead. Yeah, Francis Collins was that guy who kept getting out his guitar and singing parody versions of Over the Rainbow, uh, <laughs> as if this whole thing is a joke. You know, most of us, when we think of foreign entities corrupting uh, government agencies, we assume they're going to target the CIA in America or MI6 in the UK. But uh, the revelations of the last two years suggests that public health, the public health bureaucracies are not actually working in the interests of the people that they, they claim to be representing. Well, make no mistake, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is certainly trying to infiltrate the FBI and the CIA, and they're pretty successful at that. Um, but I think that COVID-19 mm. is a perfect example of how scientific research, public health, whatever you want to call it, um, has ramifications that impact not just national security, but the economy of the world writ large, right? COVID-19, you could describe it as a bioweapon, biological pathogen, specifically gain-of-function research, mm -hmm. lays the groundwork um, for these large-scale bioterror attacks, of which we know the Chinese Communist Party is keen on conducting, not just against their own people, um, but really the entire world. And I think it shows that naivete, which some people might call it that, but I also think it shows the actual malice coming from the United States scientific community, epitomized by the likes of Anthony Fauci and people like Francis Collins, um, who are very keen on mm. giving U.S. taxpayer dollars to Chinese Communist Party-controlled labs to do research that shouldn't be conducted in the first place, um, but let alone in the hands of the, I would say, largest existential threat uh, to the West and the way of life that, that we cherish, which, which is, of course, the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, a decade or so back, there was a big fuss uh, when it was found out that the U.S. government was doing rendition. That's where it would uh, take certain terrorist suspects and take them somewhere in Pakistan or wherever, where they could do things to get them to talk uh, that were beyond the scope of U.S. law. And this seems like a kind of scientific rendition, doesn't it? That you've got some dodgy pro project uh, and you 
want to do gain of function research. And it's a lot easier to do it in somewhere like Wuhan than it would be to do it in suburban Virginia. You're absolutely correct. It's no secret that, you know, the American ruling class loves to outsource basically everything to China, manufacturing, mm. uh, you name it. So gain of function research is no different. Um, but it shows you, I think, what the guiding principle at the National Institutes of Health is. And it's not defending or preserving the health of the American people, the health of really the West. Um, it's about being able to just do research irrespective of the consequences that can be incurred. And that's the only way that you justify doing gain-of-function research in China. Of course, we'd also talked about on this program um, how the NIH was also funding mm. risky research in Ukraine on the border of Russia in these very, very yeah. shoddily protected yeah. biolaboratory facilities. So public health, as we've said multiple times on this program, it doesn't seem to be about public health. It's always about following the money and researchers who just want to do really, really, really deadly forms of risky research um, and really have, have no regard, I think, for the consequences. Yeah, you're right. Well, uh, particularly something like Spanish flu, uh, which they're now injecting into monkeys. It's like saying, oh, it didn't, it, it, it's estimated to have killed between 50 and 100 million people uh, at the end of the Great War. But uh, we think we can improve it and make it kill even more people next time around. This is very weird stuff for public health people to be doing. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Let's uh, close it out with a couple of stumps. Stevens says, after that McDonald's scene in Nottingham, do you think the government is prepared for theft and looting on a monumental scale once inflation causes people to go hungry after being beggared by fuel heating price rises? This is very interesting, this. We were told that there were people being faced with a choice between heating or eating. Uh, it may well be if that £5,500 energy bill proves correct, they can't afford to do either. And that's uh, why uh, there's going to be a lot more scenes like that thing in that McDonald's in Nottingham. Do you think the increase in crime is connected to the cost of living crisis? I don't even like that expression, says uh, uh, Eddie says that. The cost of living crisis is the cost of lockdown. Rule by experts has totaled the world. That's going to do it for me. Dan Wooten is here to titillate your Tuesday. What you got for us, Dan? Mark Stein, good evening to you. Absolutely loved that uh, interview with Lord Sumption. You know, he was uh, my first ever guest on GB News, and what a great man he was. So it was excellent uh, to see him back. Covering a couple of the same themes as you tonight, uh, Mark Anthony uh, Fauci, what does it all mean? Will he see justice? Megyn Kelly on that uh, live from the US. Constantine Kisson. Uh, on the extraordinary bias at the BBC. Do you remember uh, a presenter recently, Mark, during an interview with Constantine, tried to tell him that he could feel the audience at a comedy show had racist intent. So Constantine kiss on how we can save the BBC. And Arlene Foster on why <laughs> she is endorsing Liz Truss. I didn't hear a word of that, Dad, but the thing about oh, no. you is you look so beautiful as <laughs> you just say it. I could watch you just... It's, I haven't seen a silent movie that good since 1923. That's Hopefully all you can Dan, hear me tonight, Mark. Uh, coming up after the weather. Stay safe, stay free. Good evening. Alex Deacon here with your latest weather updates. A big contrast with the weather tomorrow. A soggy Wednesday in some spots, but a, a hot one across East Anglia and the southeast. We're all going to start fairly warm. It's going to be a humid night tonight. Low pressure is kind of in control of things, but these weather fronts and the position of them is crucial. This one coming into the southwest, approaching Wales, will bring some fairly persistent rain, of course, particularly southwest Wales tonight and tomorrow. The rain, though, will spread more widely across Wales tonight into parts of northern England eventually and southern Scotland. One or two showers across the east this evening, one or two heavy ones as well, but they're fading away, and for most it's dry, and for most of us, a really warm and humid night. Look at these temperatures for England and Wales. Uh, towns and cities staying in the high teens quite widely. The details for Wednesday, as I said, some places having a very wet day. Certainly a 
pretty wet start for parts of northern England and Scotland, but it should turn drier here. However, southwest Wales keeping the rain going for most of the day. And again, it spreads back to north Wales and northwest England by the afternoon. At times, that rain affecting southwest England, but either side, most places dry. Slightly fresh today for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but pleasant in the sunshine. But look at the temperatures across East Anglia in the southeast, likely to hit 30 Celsius in one or two spots. So pretty hot here. That might spark one or two late thundery showers. The rain is likely to continue over parts of northwest England, Wales and southwest England during Wednesday evening. And then we could see some thundery rain drifting up from France across the channel, bringing some heavy downpours to East Anglia and the southeast. Some welcome rain in this part of the world, but it could be pretty intense. Some thunderstorms are possible may cause some disruption. So that's something to keep an eye on. During Thursday, that probably clearing away. A few showers in the northwest, but otherwise most places on Thursday dry and bright with sunny spells. Still pretty warm across the southeast on Thursday, but elsewhere start to lose that humidity with a fresher feel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club.